Matthew 10 verse 17 But beware of men. The nature of man is so corrupted that he has become a very evil and hurtful creature. We have in this chapter an account how Jesus Christ sent out his twelve disciples to teach and to do miracles. Christ had many other disciples besides those twelve. For Christ quickly after he had sent out those twelve sent out seventy more as we read in the beginning of the tenth chapter of Luke. But those twelve Christ chose out more constantly to be with him and to be after his ascension the chief instruments of propagating the gospel and establishing the Christian church in the world. And he called them apostles as in the sixth chapter of Luke at the thirteenth verse. Christ now sends out these apostles to preach the gospel and do miracles in Judea in his lifetime to be a prelude and specimen to that great work of preaching the gospel through the world upon which they were to be sent after Christ's resurrection. And Christ, in most of the charge he gives them and the things he forewarns them of, has a principal respect to that more full accomplishment of their ministry that was to be then. Our text is part of this charge. He forewarns them what need they will have to be both wise and innocent. Behold, I send you forth. They are both alike necessary for those that are amongst enemies. Want of innocency exposes a man as much as a want of prudence or policy. There are three things that it is to my present purpose to observe concerning the words of the text. Number one, what Christ bids his disciples do, or what is that act or exercise which he directs them to, they must beware, which intimates that there is something very evil and hurtful that they must beware of. There is something that is of such a nature that if they don't beware, they will be greatly in danger of being greatly hurt thereby. Number two, what it is that, that Christ bids them beware of, why it is men. They are not wild beasts, they are men. Christ doesn't confine himself to a particular sort of men. He doesn't say beware of the Jews or beware of men that have not the light of the scriptures or beware of the Gentiles. Or beware of thieves and robbers, beware of barbarians, Scythians, and the more barbarous sorts of nations, but beware of men. Number three. I would observe how this came in and how it is concerned with the foregoing verse. Christ says, but beware of men. This particular but shows some connection with the foregoing discourse. Christ told them in the foregoing verse that he sent them forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. But he says, Beware of men, as much as to say they are men and not wolves that I direct you to beware of. These are the wolves that it behooves you to beware of. These as much as it behooves sheep to beware of wolves. This manner of introducing seems to denote that men are more hurtful than wolves. Doctrine that the nature of man is so corrupted that he has become a very evil and hurtful creature. He is not only very evil in himself, not answering the end of his creation, but contradicting of it, is prone to and bent upon evil. But he is very hurtful. They are hurtful one to another, so that man can't live sincerely one by another, but had ten times so much need to beware of men as to beware of wild beasts. It will appear to reason to be so if we consider the following things first. Man is a creature that has vastly greater powers of action than any other of the creatures of this lower world. Man, though a very feeble creature compared with God and the angels, yet he is a very powerful creature and able to do great things compared with the rest of the creatures of this lower creation. The faculties of the mind of man are such as make him to be of very vast abilities in comparison of the brute creatures. Man is mightier by his reason than any other creature with their strength of body, and would be if their strength was a thousand times so great as it is without reason. 
It is but little that the brute creatures can do. The most that they are capacitated to do by nature is some few simple acts for the getting of their food and defending themselves and their young, and some of them to serve men. Men are fitted and capacitated both by the faculties of their mind and also by the make of their bodies for vastly greater works. Man's powers and abilities are exceeding extensive. He that travels or reads history and contemplates the works that man has done upon earth, how the earth has been subdued by them, what cities have been built, what kingdoms have been erected, sees how extensive the powers are which God has given them. Thus Nebuchadnezzar glories in Daniel 4 verse 30 is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. The abilities of man have extended to the leveling of mountains, turning the course of mighty rivers, conquering the world, crossing the ocean, and going round the world. The powers that God has given man give him the dominion here in this lower world and make him to be like God with respect to the rest of the creatures. This is one thing in which the image of God in man appears that he rules over the rest of the creation. There is no sort of brute creature whatsoever but what the reason and powers of man have subdued and tamed. Those that have much greater strength than man, the fiercest and strongest and mightiest of them, lions, elephants, tigers, leopards, and crocodiles, and those that swim in the sea, yet they are not out of the way of man's dominion. Men find ways to take them, even the mightiest wells of the sea, and get them into their power, and the fowls of heaven. Though they have wings to fly, yet man who goes on the earth by his reason finds ways to rule over them. So James 3 verse 7. For every kind of beasts and birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. So that man is able to do vastly more hurt than any other kind of creature. There is no sort of creature, however fierce and strong, that can do that hurt that man can do. There are many sorts of wild beasts that are exceeding noisome and hurtful, but there are none that are so capacitated to do mischief as man is. Man is a creature of such extensive powers and abilities that unless he be well disposed, if he be inclined to evil, is doubtless vastly the most hurtful creature in the world. The more powerful any being is, the greater nuisance and mischief he is. If he be ill, inclined. That makes the devil so hurtful. He is a being of great abilities, able to do a great deal of mischief. Man is a creature whose powers of action are such that one man, if he be ill, inclined, may do as much hurt as hundreds of the most pestilent wild beasts, which is abundantly verified in history. There have been men, some one of which have done as much hurt, it may be, as all the wild beasts in the world have done in many ages together, if not since the world began. I speak not now of the mischief they have done to men's souls, but of the hurt they have done to men's bodies in destroying and making havoc of mankind, so that man is able, if he is disposed to it, to be a very evil, hurtful creature. Number two. Man is a very busy, active creature. He not only has very extensive powers and abilities, but is very much disposed to use his abilities some way or other, either in doing good or hurt. Man not only can do, but he will do something. If man were a powerful creature and could do a great deal, yet if he were a lifeless, inactive sort of creature, not disposed any way to put forth his power either one way or the other, then he might, notwithstanding his abilities, be neither good and profitable nor yet very hurtful. But it is not so. Man is very busy, an active creature. He is naturally inclined to action. This disposition appears in men even while children and much more afterwards. Those that we call lazy and idle... It isn't so much because they are destitute of action or because they do nothing to good purpose, 
They won't take any pains to resist evil inclinations, lusts, and evil dispositions. Men are as active in the idle, and often the more for their idleness. Man, as he is of greater powers and abilities than the beasts, so he is a much more busy and active creature than they. The activity of the beasts is ordinarily limited to a few things that pertain about their food and self-preservation and their young. But man's head is full of designs and schemes for the accomplishment of this and that. He has many contrivances and is always busy to bring to pass one thing or other and is ordinarily many things in pursuit at once. Man's reason as it gives him a larger prospect than the beasts so he sees more than they do. So he sees more to stir him up to action. He sees more to excite his active powers, though they have but little in view, see but little to pursue. But man that has such an extensive faculty as understanding, whereby he sees so much and can conceive of more, will always be pursuing and seeking much. This I take to be the reason that man is a more active and busy creature than the beasts. The beasts have but little that they see, and so but little that they seek. But man, whose understanding extends to so much, is insatiable in his desires, and nothing less than an infinite object can satisfy him. Man is a more active creature than the beasts in this respect, as his passions are more violent, man's desires are more strong. If man hates, his hate is so violent that there is nothing in the least to be compared to it. If he is enraged, he is more furious by far than any brute creature. It is surprising how far the anger and rage of man has carried them, and what effects there have been of it. So that man has not only very great and extensive powers of action, so that they are able to do a great deal of hurt, but they are naturally busy and active and disposed to use these powers some way or other as in doing good or hurt. Therefore it must be according as his disposition is. If his disposition is bad, doubtless he is with all this a very evil and hurtful creature indeed. Let us therefore in the next place inquire into his disposition. Number three. Man naturally has no other principle to direct and govern him in his actions, but only self-love. Man is born into the world with those powers and abilities that has been mentioned, and with that disposition to be busy and active, as we have heard, and with no other principle to direct and govern those powers and this activity, but self-love. It is nothing else but this that holds the rein, so that we may easily know what judgment to make as to man's disposition, and whether or not he be not an evil and hurtful creature. Man, as he comes into the world, has no principle of love to God to govern him, or restrain him in any measure, nor has he any principle of love to man, but only so far as self-love may, in some cases, be a principle of love to others, and no further. But self-love is the only thing that governs. There is no other guide for those extensive powers and abilities which God has given men. We may easily judge, therefore, how they are like to be guided. This being the only principle he has to govern him, all that a man is prompted to pursue is his own private and separate interest. Then he will have no sincere regard at all to the glory of God or the good of others. He'll seek his own profit, his own advancement, and the gratifying of his own appetites. Let what will be the effect with respect to others' good. This principle of self-love will pursue those things. Let them be never so inconsistent with the good of others, and though it be never so much to the prejudice of others. First, if the good of others stands in the way of private interest, this principle will stir up to destroy that good of others. If it lies in his power, however great and important that good of others is, and though it be the good of never so many. Thus, if the comfort or credit or estates and or lives of others, of any man or any number of men whatsoever stand in the way of the particular private interest of him that has no other principle, but self-love to govern him, 
Such a person will destroy all this unless he is restrained by something extrinsic. For what should hinder? For it is love to himself that governs him. It is love to his own interest, and no love to the interest of others. And therefore, how much soever the interest of others is hurt, though it be of never so many, if he does but gain his own interest by it, he is not crossed at all. There is nothing that hurts him, but he is gratified, because his self-love is gratified. Those that are only governed by self-love, if it was in their power to destroy a whole nation or the whole world, if they could gratify their self-love by it and promote their private interests by it, they would do it. What should hinder them, unless there is something without themselves that restrains them? He that is governed by love to his own honor and advancement, why his own honor and advancement he will love, let others be never so much depressed by it. If all the world be trampled underfoot, he cares not for that. Yea, he delights in it in case he thinks he has his own advancement in it. So he that is governed by a love to his own profit and pleasure, and has nothing out of himself to restrain him, he won't stick. If it lies in his power of depriving others of all that they have, of wronging and abusing them in any degree, yea, he won't stick at bringing the whole world and all sorts of men, good and bad, into the greatest distress and misery conceivable, to gain his own pleasure or profit, though it be never so little. If he looks upon it that he gains by it, though he adds never so little to his own pleasure, yet if he does but add, he will do whatever lies in his power to get it. Yea, further, if it lay in the person's power that is governed wholly by self-love to pull God out of heaven and to kill him, if he could promote his own interest by it, though never so little, or looked upon God as it all standing in the way of that interest, he would do it. Number two, it is all alike whether an action be just or unjust to one that is governed only by self, provided he promotes his own interest by it. Self-love doesn't stand to make any other distinction, but only what is for his own interest and what not. Just or unjust, it is all alike to that, provided it be alike in that respect, that is equally its own interest. Let an action be never so injurious, base and unreasonable. The question with self-love is not whether it be reasonable or unreasonable, but whether it is for his own interest or not. Self-love has no abhorrence at all of moral evil. All that that abhors is natural evil. Indeed, God in mercy so orders it in many things that moral evil is very apparently contrary to their present temporal interest, and so they are restrained. But we shall speak of the manner of God's restraining the wickedness of men afterwards. Number three, self-love, if it be the governing principle, will dispose a person to hate all that happens to stand in its way. If any happen to stand in the way of such in one's honor or profit or pleasure, his self-love will dispose him to hate such an one. Whether that other person does voluntarily and actively oppose it, or whether he accidentally or rather providentially stands in his way. Thus a man that is governed by a love to his own honor, he has that principal reign in him that will naturally dispose him to hate another that stands in the way of his honor, though never so innocently or undesignedly. It will dispose him to hate another man that prospers more than he, though all his fault be his prosperity. It will tend to make him hate good men because they oppose him in their enjoying their sinful pleasures. It will tend to make them malicious and revengeful. Self-love will make men of a murderous disposition, universal and mortal enemies to all that anyway stand in the way of it, or don't promote it so much as they would have them. Though things are plainly the natural and necessary tendency of self-love when it is the sole governing principle, and now judge whether or not it be in thus with men naturally, whether we need to be aware of them, whether seeing that man is able to do so much and is so active a creature, and is governed only by self-love, he be not a very evil and hurtful creature. Especially considering, number four, man is such a creature that no means of restraint have any certain influences upon him. If they had, that would not hinder man's being in himself of a very evil and hurtful nature. 
but that they have not, it shows that they are actually very evil and hurtful. There are many manners of restraint of the violent corruption of man's heart. For instance, God has made a revelation of another world, of a future state of rewards and punishments. But this has no certain influence upon men. Men are so unbelieving, has his understanding so darkened, that he is very difficultly made to realize any such thing, and so stupid and senseless is he that, very commonly, men regard what they are told of a future state but little. And the influence of it is so uncertain that one can have no dependence upon that. Even those that have the most warning will not go to any length whatsoever in gross wickedness. Many men have no fear of God before their eyes. Psalm 36 verse 1. Human laws are another means of restraint, but this has no certain influence upon men. Men, if they are restrained in the presence of others, won't be restrained by those when they can be hid from the eyes of others and when they can practice wickedness secretly. A regard to men's conduct is another means of restraint, but this has no certain influence. Education is another means of restraint, but this has no certain influence either. Such is man's corruption that it very frequently breaks through all restraints. There is no trusting to ordinary means of restraint. Therefore, doubtless, there was a reason for the advice that Christ gave, and we had need to beware of men. A man is actually in his natural state a very evil and hurtful creature. Thus we have evidenced the doctrine by reason, but experience abundantly testifies the same thing. It shows that for all the means of restraint that the world has, that the corruption of man is like the raging waves of the sea and is untamable. That which the Apostle James said of the tongue is to be understood of man's corruption that shows itself by the tongue. It is a fire that is kindled from hell. It defiles the whole man. It is a world of iniquity. It sets on fire the course of nature. It is a deadly poison, an unruly evil that which no man can tame. However, they can tame the fiercest wild beasts. James 3, verses 6 to 8. There is no such sort of creature in the world as mankind that bites and devours one another, and consumes and destroys one another. Galatians 5, verse 15. The greater part of the calamity and misery that men meet with in the world, mankind brings one upon another. Most of the public calamities that disturb kingdoms and commonwealths arise from men's wickedness. Men are become by the fall a generation of vipers, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. Isaiah 1 verse 4. God in his ordinary mere providence scarce ever brings such outward calamities and miseries on men as men do often bring upon one another. Man has that disposition in him that tends to make him delight in doing ill to others in some way or other. If they are restrained from murder and robbery and other enormous villainies, yet they will show the same disposition in that they are delighting to judge and backbite and reproach others. Man's corruption makes him an unreasonable creature. They will be angry with others and will hate others for doing by them as they themselves do and allow themselves to do by others. Man's corruption makes him perverse and obstinate. They very often won't hearken to reason. They shut their eyes oftentimes against the plainest reason when it is against their interest, but will be quick enough when it falls in with it. So corrupt is mankind that we must beware of them. Yea, there are many that there is no trusting in. Proverbs 20, verse 6. A faithful man who can find. Man has become like the serpent in this regard. That they are exceeding deceitful. Psalm 28, verse 3. They speak peace to their neighbor, but mischief is in their hearts. So evil and hurtful a creature is man that the Son of God himself, when he was in their power, did not escape. Christ had reason to bid his disciples beware of men when he knew what treatment he should meet with from them. Men are exceeding hurtful to one another's souls as well as bodies. Nothing is more common than for men to be the occasion of one another's damnation. And they, many of them, are industrious in this work of undoing and damning souls. 
Sometimes one man has a great hand in putting hundreds into hell. Application by way of instruction, inference 1. Hence we may observe how dreadful the effects of the fall have been. Man was far from being such a creature in the state wherein God first created him. He was then harmless and holy. He then had indeed self-love, but it was a servant. The noble and extensive powers of man then were not subject to such a blind guide as mere self-love, as they were under the guidance and direction of a principle that was fit to guide them, that was worthy to have the government, that was love to God. This is a noble and excellent principle, and as long as this held the reins and had that perfect ascendant in government, which it then had, man was not disposed to do anything but good and not to any evil. But how much otherwise it is now, we have heard under the doctrine, and that sin of our first parents in eating the forbidden fruit has brought all this mischief, has thus depraved and corrupted and ruined man's nature. It has turned the world which before was a delightful abode for an innocent and holy creature into a wilderness full of serpents and wild beasts. Man's nature which before was like the nature of the holy angels has now become more hurtful and that which there is more need to be aware of than that of the most noisome beasts. Man's nature is now such that he has become hurtful to himself and very hurtful to others, and if God were in his power, would be hurtful and mortal to him. It is not for want of inclination that he is not so. So is the nature of man corrupted that it is the nature of man itself that has become the greatest pest to the world of mankind. This world that we live in is a world of affliction and calamity. We complain of the evil and troublesomeness of the world, but if we consider the manner, the greater part of the trouble and misery that there is in the world of mankind is brought upon it by men themselves. If man were universally holy and innocent as the gospel directs, this world would be a heaven upon earth in comparison of what it is. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 the heart of man is desperately wicked. Inference 2. How justly God may destroy man. Men in their natural state are so depraved and corrupted that unless there is a change made in them, they are fit for nothing else but to be taken and destroyed, as it is with noisome beasts, poisonous serpents, wolves, and others. They are looked upon as doing well that destroy them wherever they find them. 2 Peter 2.12 But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. How righteous is it that God should destroy them who are so under the reigning power of a disposition that is so destructive to others and would not be satisfied with anything short of the destruction of God if that were possible. If God had appointed his whole world of mankind to utter destruction, it would have been just. And it is of his mere grace that he is pleased to save a number of them. God does man no wrong if he refuses them any mercy and leaves them to perish in their own corruption. For such is their nature. So corrupt are they that they deserve no other. Inference 3. What a mercy it is that God is pleased so to restrain the corruption and wickedness of mankind. If God did not restrain man's corruption and set bounds to it, as he does to the waves of the sea, we can scarce conceive whereunto it would come. The world would be turned into a wilderness indeed. Men would be one to another like devils, and this habitable earth would become in a great measure like hell. We may easily see that it would be so if we had a little call to mind what was said under the doctrine, namely, that man is naturally under the government of no other principle but self-love, without the least degree of respect to God or any other being, any further than in some cases self-love itself may cause men to have a kind of respect to some others. And that this principle, if this be not restrained, will stir men up to seek their own private interest, though it be never so much as others cost, that the good of others is no way regarded by it, but only his own good. 
that self-love values the least addition to a person's private interest or pleasure, more than the happiness and welfare of the whole world, and would not stick at all to destroy all the world or bring upon them the greatest possible miseries, and the least to promote their private interest. That is all alike to this principle, whether an action be just or unjust, because that self-interest is all that self looks at, without any consideration of the quality of the means by which it is obtained. Let a thing be never so unrighteous, unreasonable, and base, or cruel, or pernicious. Self-love had as much to do as the fairest and most honest thing in the world, provided it looks upon it equally for its own interest. It may easily be made evident to a demonstration that it must be so, for the only object of self-love is self-interest. And therefore, that which is looked upon as being most in its self-interest will be chosen by it without any regard to anything else. What a dreadful place then would this world be if God did not lay restraints upon the corruption of men. For we all of us naturally are under the government of no other principle but self-love. And there are but very few of mankind but what are left so. They have no other principle but self-love that governs them. It is owing, therefore, to the restraints God lays upon men's wickedness that there is any tolerable living in the world. God, who made this world, watches over it and takes care of it. And he knows whereunto the wickedness of men would soon come were it left wholly alone. He is therefore pleased to restrain and keep it within some bounds. And this is a great mercy of God that he does so. The world would be in much more sorrowful circumstances than it is if God did not take care of it and restrain the wickedness of it. God has wisely and mercifully so ordered things in this world. To self-love in one thing is a restraint to self-love in another thing. So that though man has but that one principle of self-love by which he is governed, Yet God has wisely so contrived this manner that that principle shall be a restraint to itself. Thus oftentimes men's self-love would stir them up to rob or murder their neighbors, for by this they might revenge themselves, or by this they might enrich themselves. But though it would be for their self-interest in one way, yet they see that it would be against their self-interest in another way so to do. Self-love would be gratified in one respect by it, but it would be more crossed in another, and so this restrains them. So self-love would often stir men up to commit adultery or incest, but though it gratifies self-love in one thing, yet it crosses it in another. Number 1. God, by the light of nature, discovers his own being to men, and that he will punish the wickedness of mankind. And this is a restraint. The heathen, Though they lacked divine revelation, yet they had the notice of a deity. They believed there were gods and that they would punish unrighteousness. Number two. And God has been pleased to make a revelation of another world in a future judgment. A hell of eternal misery for the punishment of wickedness. And this is a great restraint upon the wickedness of the world. They are restrained by fear. So here God makes use of self-love to be a restraint to it. Their love of their future interest is a restraint to their love of their present profit and pleasure. If men were not restrained by a fear of future punishment, what wickednesses would they commit? There is a great part of the world that enjoys the light of the word of God in which a future world is revealed. And most of the heathen have among them some obscure indications about it whereby some dark notice is derived down to them through all generations from their ancestors that had the light of revelation, and others have borrowed many things from the Jews and Christians, as many of the heathen philosophers did. Number three, God has ordained civil government in the world. For the apostle teaches us that civil government is the ordinance of God, Romans 13, verse 12. It seems God when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, taught men to form themselves into civil societies, which in a measure has been kept up among all nations. Necessity and men's love to themselves easily taught them to continue it and maintain the custom in all nations. And this is a restraint upon the wickedness of the world. 
This is a great restraint upon the wickedness of the heathen world. It is said that in a certain country it was determined that for so many days it was but a very few, that there should be no government, no law should be in force, and no law should take hold on anything that was done in those days, to teach the people the worth and necessity of government. And there were all manner of outrages committed, and so it would be even in countries that enjoyed the light of the gospel. Number four. Another thing that is a great restraint to the wickedness of the world is men's regard to their credit. Here again, it is so ordered that self-love in one thing should restrain self-love in another. Men's love to their honor and credit oftentimes restrains their love to their pleasure and profit. There are many would-be liars, thieves, fornicators, and adulterers, and incestuous, and sodomites that commit all sorts of villainies, but that a love to their credit restrains them. Immorality was dishonorable among the heathen, though there were none that had any true love to virtue. It comes to pass by this means, every man's conscience tells him that wickedness is dishonorable, that it deserves shame, and every one was ready enough to declare how shameful it was when they saw it in others, for the wickedness of others was injurious to them. And so it came to be, the general voice even amongst the heathen, that vice was shameful, and men were brought up in that notion. And though all were agreed in their love of wickedness, yet one man was not privy to another's approbation of it. And so was the shame to expose his own. And so it was generally agreed that vice was dishonorable. And this was a great restraint to the wickedness of the world. And then the legislators, which were men generally the most in esteem, their making laws against it, did virtually declare it shameful. Number five. Another restraint upon the wickedness of the world is natural affection. This is a love that arises from self-love, but yet it restrains the corruption of the heart from injuring those that are the objects of it, or otherwise often would be. Number six. Another restraint upon the wickedness of the world is education. Many parents, even amongst the heathen, they saw that vice was shameful and dishonorable amongst men, and that as the world was constituted, it tended to persons hurt, and they educated their children in the practice of many moral virtues, and the impressions that were made are corrupt. Number seven, another thing that is a great restraint to the wickedness of the world is that there are a number in the world of truly godly persons. The children of God are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5, verse 13. It is to the church that are committed the oracles of God, and it is they that keep and hold forth to the rest of the world the revelation which God has given, which is a great restraint to the wickedness of the world. The church is a pillar and ground of truth, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. They are the principal outward means of maintaining outward religion, of keeping up the ordinances and visible worship of God, and the credit of religion in the world, which are also great restraints. These dwell amongst the wicked. The wheat grows amongst the tares, Matthew 13, verse 30. Let both grow together till the end, because they are mingled amongst them, are united to them by neighborhood and relation and civil and ecclesiastical bounds. They have influence upon their children and their relations and those that they are conversant with. Some of them are teachers of churches and some are concerned in civil affairs and so have influence to restrain the wickedness of the world. Number eight. God restrains the wickedness of men also by particular providences. God determines how far he will allow men's wickedness to proceed and has an eye to that in his providence with them. Thus God mercifully by his providence prevents many acts of wickedness that men have designed and contrived, as David in 2 Samuel 25 verse 34. God oftentimes meets with men when in their career in wickedness and stops them by some providence, some unexpected providence, some affliction or something that shall divert their minds. Number nine, God restrains men's wickedness also by the influence of his spirit. 
by assisting natural conscience in restraining man. The Spirit of God assists men's reason to see the evidence of his own being by the light of nature, or by the light of divine revelation. He makes them sensible of the guilt of sin and how they will expose themselves to his wrath. He causes conscience oftentimes to check and restrain men, taken about some wicked design, or stops them when going on in a way of wickedness. Some he keeps from ever running into such gross sins as others practice by this means, and others he restrains and reforms, and brings from a vicious to a moral course of life. Thus mercifully does God deal with a wicked world in restraining the wickedness of it, which otherwise would be very much like hell. There is nothing else that keeps wicked men here from being better than the damned in hell but those restraints. And that is all the reason that they are so much worse there than here, because their all restraints are taken off. It is the same corruption of heart that reigns in both. But God restrains the wickedness here because this world is not a place designed for the perfect unrestrained reign of sin. Hell is a receptacle of the filth of this world. And then there is a number of mankind that are intended for eternal salvation. And this world is to be their abode during a state of probation, which it would not be fit to be if the corruption of man was let alone and was not restrained. It is very much for the sake of those who are the salt of the earth that men's wickedness is restrained. Fourth inference. Hence learn how excellently the gospel is adapted to the state of mankind. The gospel is that great remedy which God has provided for this corrupt and wretched state of mankind. And it is excellently suited to be a remedy. The doctrine may teach us how we, who are naturally like raven and wolves, stand in need of such a person as a holy and innocent Lamb of God to be sent among us to teach us and revive us out of our corruption. How did we need such an example as Christ has set us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, who appeared with the innocency of the dove in the midst of a generation of vipers? who showed a marvelous spirit of meekness, patience, and love to condemn our unreasonable and pernicious dispositions. How excellently are the doctrines and riches of the gospel suited to our circumstances, which are so much calculated to promote holiness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, peace, love, and mercy. It is the nature and tendency of the gospel, with all with whom it is effectual to change such a spirit and temper as this, and therefore the times of the gospel are prophesied of as a time where noisome and venomous beasts should lose their hurtful nature and become harmless, Isaiah 11, verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. This is meant in no other sense than only that men who are naturally such evil and hurtful creatures should be changed to be innocent and harmless. Number 5. Hence we learn what need men have of having their natures changed. It is with all men universally, as we have heard under the doctrine, they are all of the, the same nature, all have the very same corruption of heart. Therefore, doubtless, there is a necessity in order to man being brought out of his fallen and ruined state, that his nature should be changed, that he should be born again, made and created again by the power of the same God that gave us a being. See the reason of that, that Christ says in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some hold that there is no other change in conversion, but only a change of manners and customs, only a moral, not a physical change. That a man gets a habit of godliness by custom, as men get any other habit, by using themselves to any practice. And that that conviction and persuasion he has in conversion is no other way than a man is convinced of anything, or persuaded to anything, in common secular affairs. Those that maintain such doctrine, it is a sign they were never sensible of the corruption of man's nature, never were sensible what a kind of creature man has become by the fall. This the scripture teaches us, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, Second Corinthians 5.14, that he is born again, John 3.3, 3, 
puts off the old man with his deeds and puts on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, Ephesians 4.24. Number two, use of exhortation. Seek that you may see the corruption and wickedness of your own heart. Notwithstanding that man is such a creature as we have shown that he is, yet how little sensible are men of it. They have notwithstanding all this generally a good opinion of themselves. Their nature doesn't appear to be so dreadful to them as they do. They realize it that they are. They are not sensible that they have the seeds of such dreadfulness and wickedness as they hear of in others in their own hearts. When Elisha told Haziel that what he would do hereafter, he did not think it was in his heart to do so wickedly, Second Kings 8 verse 11. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Haziel said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Haziel said, But what, is thy servant a dog, that he should do this great thing? There are many that have all the corruption in their hearts and its full strength and power. They are full, as bad as has been described, and never had their nature one jot amended, that yet have a high opinion of themselves for their goodness. They look upon themselves, and what they do is very lovely in the sight of God, and they trust to it. It is the ground of their expectation of salvation. They trust that God loves them for it and will be moved by it to hear their prayers and give them an interest in Christ. What is more common for such as has been described under the doctrine to trust in their own goodness, to their morality and to their prayers, and that they do so much for God, waiting upon him, thinking upon him, and speaking of him, and calling upon him so often that they are so strict in doing as God commands them, so sottishly blind and ignorant are men of themselves. But seek that you may not be blind. Be often in searching your own heart and pray to God that he would discover the corruption of your heart to you. It is necessary in order to a remedy of your corruption that you should first see it. Number two, exhortation. I would apply Christ's counsel in the text to you, beware of men. Though you aren't alike exposed to persecution as the disciples were then, yet you live amongst those that are of the same nature as those that Christ directed them to beware of. Though we live in a Christian country and in a land of great light, yet we all of us, for all of that, have great need to beware of men, and especially beware lest your souls suffer from it. This Christ meant he did not so much mean bodies. Men who are such hurtful creatures are in nothing so hurtful one to another as they are to each other's souls. Therefore, as you regard the eternal life of your soul, beware of men. Particularly beware, lest you be led away by their ill examples. Men lead one another to hell by their example. Men are exceeding apt to be led by example. The world is full of ill examples in all parts, great and small, rich and poor, and many professors of godliness whose example above all has a pernicious tendency. You must beware, therefore, of such men as these as well as others. Example of companions, many ruin thus, they corrupt good motions, take heed of being corrupted by evil communication, considering that you live among men. You had need to take heed who you accompany with. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Proverbs 13, verse 20. Companion of fools shall be destroyed. A company with none that are of a profane or lewd conversation or use unclean talk. Such wonderfully corrupts the mind. A company with none of those that don't govern their tongues and seem to delight in backbiting and reproaching others. Avoid such as these. Take heed lest you be defiled by them. Proverbs 22:24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to your soul. Third exhortation, let those that make profession of godliness to take heed that they be not hurtful. It will be exceeding unbecoming of you to be hurtful to the souls or bodies of men. You may be hurtful to souls by dishonoring your profession. 
biennial conversation. By doing that which is exceeding unbecoming, high-spiritedness, malice, envy, revenge, settled ill will against any of your neighbors, backbiting, delighting to tell of others' faults. It becomes you above all to be holy and harmless, to be like Jesus Christ, an innocent Lamb of God, to be of a meek and quiet spirit. By no means to seek your neighbor's hurt, however they seek your hurt. The Lamb doesn't turn at the wolf to fight with him. You should do good to all, Galatians 6.10. Do good unto all men. Do only good and not hurt. Seek all men's welfare, Romans 16.19. Be wise to do good, simple concerning evil, harmless as doves, as in the verse before the text, become as little children, Matthew 18, 3. Be peacemakers, seek peace and pursue it, 1 Peter 3, 11. Be gentle towards all men, love those that hate you, do good to them that despitefully use you. Jonathan Edwards, man is a very evil and hurtful creature. 